this is Charlie Montetuyel with Blue Bear Flutes. Of course, I always bring up our crazy old website, bluebearflutes.com. I know most of you have been there. Uh, and of course, all of our social media where you can find some really great stuff. But I always like to stop at the beginning of the video and let you know, hey, look, y'all really should check out my Instagram. The Instagram is something that my wife runs on a regular basis, puts pictures up all the time. We don't make any money off of it. I'm just telling you to look at our Instagram because it's so cool looking. And you know, I'm not really one that goes on Instagram very often. I follow a couple of celebrities, a couple of celebrities that I know personally, and then uh, I look at ours, which is crazy, but I do. Uh, but anyway, all that aside, what I wanted to do today was share with you something that I know many of you, well, probably really haven't thought of, but some of you have actually asked me. Um, you might be interested in knowing what the very first flute I made 33 years ago looks like. And here it is. So it's a really great uh, flute, definitely seriously handmade. Uh, instead of using routers and sanders and stuff like that uh, on this flute here, I used a pocket knife to whittle out the inside, used a ton of sandpaper. Oh my gosh, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of sandpaper back in the good old days when they made good sandpaper and they didn't have to slap some fancy label on it and tell you that it was Kalamazoo made sandpaper when really it's not. Okay, nothing about Kalamazoo. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this flute here is kind of interesting in a number of ways. It is very plain and very simple, which is kind of my style, um, but it has a pointy mouthpiece, which I normally don't do today, uh, simply because this promotes basically uh, the flute wetting out because when you put anything in your mouth, it triggers a salivary reaction. But in addition to that, uh, it's a really great old flute. The cool thing about it is, and I don't know if any of you can tell, you're probably thinking, is that made out of walnut? What is? What kind of wood is that? This is actually something that I, for the longest time, called black cedar. Uh, there's no real such thing as black cedar that I know of. I've worked in cedar all my life. And uh, the reason we call this black cedar is because my dad and I dredged a log up out of the uh, river where we used to live. People hadn't really been on the river very often for probably 50, 60 years, something in that kind of time frame. Um, and my dad and I would go and get logs, most of the time because I was so young, he would go get them, but I would always help him, uh, especially when he come back to the shore and needed me to help him uh, bring it up and do everything that we did to the logs. But um, he found this one cedar log that had been underwater for, we estimated, probably two or three hundred years. Um, big cedar tree. I mean, this sucker was probably, I don't know, it was huge anyway, probably somewhere around a foot in diameter, which is pretty, pretty reasonable size. Um, and uh, I guess the log that we cut off of it was probably around, I'd say almost 15 feet long, which is huge in my opinion. I mean, I've seen a lot of cedar tree. Um, but uh, when we got it, it had been soaking in the water for so long that all the saps and resins and mud and iron and whatever, because our swamp we lived in was very iron rich, so much that you could go in areas of it and see the iron seeping up through the bubbling water along with the methane and other things that would happen. Sometimes there would be a methane eruption under the river. And when the methane eruption happens, most of you probably never seen this before, not living in swamps like I did. But uh, when a methane eruption happens, there's a, a huge gas bubble underneath um, the soil under the water. And so it'll eventually move up and down, move up and down, and it blows up. And when it pops, um, leaves will go everywhere. And depending on the size of the methane, um, let's see, I guess vein we could call it, it will uh, suck water back down through it, sometimes forever and a day. So I've, I've seen a whirlpool probably 30 or 40 feet in diameter in my little river I used to live on. And uh, this methane would be bubbling up out of it. At the same time, there's a whirlpool with leaves and all kinds of mass from underneath the, the mud uh, down there. So like I said, we live, just to paint you a little picture of what it was that, that this guy here was originally shaped as <laughs> before he got made into a flute. It's also uh, quite tapered too, which is really interesting compared to the flutes that I make today. Uh, we don't do the taper anymore, uh, along with the pointy mouthpiece and a very simple, simple block, which is kind of kind of common today, I guess. Um, one other little thing, if you might be interested in seeing, I'm gonna slide this down here. I used to put a piece of wood underneath of the block, and this piece of wood here would 
be my track area. So it's easy to cut the track out of a piece of wood and then slap it down there. I used to tie them on, glue them on, leave them loose, do whatever it takes to make it happen. But if you'll notice one other thing too, um, the track area actually isn't that long. If you look where the air supply hole is and you see the sound hole down below it, the track is only maybe about this long. That today is not what I do. And so many of you have asked me over the years, and I say over the years, we've been on YouTube for like 10 years or something. Uh, at this point, once again, don't like to, to put a date on anything so that you aren't watching this 20 years from now thinking, no, oh, he's been on YouTube a lot longer than that. But um, anyway, uh, in the time that we've been on YouTube, I've had a number of people ask me, how long should this area be? The distance between the sound hole and the air supply hole. Truthfully, there's no right or wrong. Uh, there's things that produce one kind of result and things that produce another kind of result. Both of them have their positive ends. I have a hard time seeing the negative side of, of either one of them. Although, I do have a preference. I usually make a track. Here's another old flute. Not too old, but uh, let's see if I can slide this down enough quickly for you to see. I do usually make a track between three quarters of an inch. You can see that sound hole down here in the air supply. It's usually between an inch and three quarters of an inch long. Um, it gives the, oh gosh, I hate to mention rifling or anything that might get me <laughs> get this video stricken from YouTube, um, but um, if I were trying to shoot air, that, that should work, right? In a straight line, if I used a straight path that was longer for that air to go, it would be a very defined straight line, although it would be slower. And, gosh, I just keep thinking back to hunting and using hunting analogies, but if I do that, then you may not get to see this video, so let's stay away from that. Uh, let's see here. It's easier for a drag racer <laughs> to race down a straight track than it is to race around an oval track, right? And that's because of how fast the drag racer is traveling. Uh, it's difficult to steer. Well, uh, that kind of works in reverse. If you make a straight track, the air is not going to steer away from it. So the downside of it is though, when you have a long track, like I usually use a three quarters of an inch long track, um, the downside is that it creates more back pressure. So some things happen differently. Now, with that in mind, the reason that this flute here has a short track was because I was under the pretense, as so many flute makers I have talked to in my lifetime were, or are really because I don't think any of them change your mind except for me. I was under the pretense that to have a flute that responded quickly, I needed to have a short track. That is nowhere near the universe or even the ballpark on the planet inside of the solar system of the universe of being true. So you could throw that idea out the window. Millions of flutes down the road, that don't matter. Okay. So uh, long story short, you can make your track whatever size you want. I prefer about three quarters of an inch to an inch. Doesn't have to be that way. There's no right or wrong. Uh, old flutes, have them short and some have them long. I've seen one that was about two inches long. Somebody actually asked me in a recent um, YouTube comment on a previous video about that long track flute. And I mentioned to them, that I believe it was in a time series of Native American um, history books and uh, that means it's probably either, the flute itself is probably either in holdings at the Native American Museum in DC, if it's still around when you see this video, or one of the um, museums in Minnesota. So probably the one in St. Paul, if I'm guessing right. Um, one of the uh, Native American exhibits here. But anyway, long story short, it doesn't really matter how long your track is. You will find benefits in either way, and you can promote whichever one works for you. So. That having been said, this flute has hardly, if at all, been played uh, in a long time, and I don't normally play it. I usually leave it on a really beautiful stand that one of my customers made for me as a gift. Uh, we have so many gifts from our customers, which is super sweet, not necessary, but greatly appreciated. But I keep it on a stand. He's got of um, this like uh, old Native American, uh, I can't even remember the name. It's a picture that's been drawn. Do you remember the name of the? The picture anyway it's a beautiful stand i should have probably brought it with me but but uh i keep it on that stand and that's it i don't don't really play it it doesn't perform the way that i like my new flutes to perform it is a great and excellent flute has a wonderful sound has some qualities because of the wood 
uh, type that are unique and uh, just don't, I don't play it all the time. As a matter of fact, up until a couple of years ago when my mom passed away, it had been in her keeping for almost 20 years. So I haven't, uh, haven't been around it for a long time. She actually had one other one that I'm going to talk to my sister about if she, she can help me find it. And maybe I'll bring that one because it's also made out of the same black looking cedar wood. Really just cool wood. And it's so shiny. You think, oh, that's definitely lacquered. This is not lacquered. This is like 20 years of oil on, you know, on the wood. And really, it's only 10 good years of it and then sporadically after that until whenever. Uh, and then, of course, I even reoiled it tonight to help hopefully bring some shine to it. Let's see what it sounds like. 33-year-old flute. than we make today. So the sound hole is a little larger. It's quite airy. That's probably because it's old and doesn't get played much. It needs a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, I don't normally put this slot in here anymore. It seemed like a good idea at the time. A lot of people swear by it. It's useless. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's useless. Uh, it looks good, you know, and a lot of uh, old people used to have the same idea that it was good. And I say old people, I guess in older times, Native Americans had a similar idea because there's a lot of flutes that had that slot in it. In my opinion and in my experience, not to put down the elders, uh, it's just not, it's not as functional as it seems like it should be. I wish it was, but it's not. And it evolved from something else, and that was functional, so maybe we'll talk about that one day. In which way, I hope this video finds you all well. I hope you've enjoyed it for the short time that I've asked for your attention, and uh, I hope to see you all again very soon here on Blue Bear Flutes YouTube channel. We'll talk to you again. Y'all take care.